When it comes to Disney movies, most people tend to look at the slick and clean image that they usually present with their animated movies. They're the ones that most kids and adults spend time loving because of how family-friendly their stories and messages are. But then again, that was something that Walt Disney also felt disappointed by, feeling shackled at this very clean image when he saw films like How to Kill a Mockingbird wanting to do something like that, but still limited to what the perception that Disney had going for the public, which of course continued with their family-friendly attitude we knew of now. But of course, during the time of the Disney Renaissance, came a new opportunity presenting us with something darker. I'm not saying they wanted to do it for all of it, considering the success came with the most colorful, light-hearted stories like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, but not as dark as what you would expect. Where during that same time frame when they wanted to get more grounded with other stories came the opportunity to actually go dark with the likes of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And The Hunchback of Notre Dame remains to be one of my most favorite Disney movies ever, and it's not hard to see why, with its more dark and ambitious tone than what most of Disney has done in the past, now in the present, and its future. And of course, this isn't going to deny that the film is still filled with a myriad of problems like the gargoyles themselves. I mean, they aren't bad in concept, but the way their humor is handled drags down the film to just try to make kids happy, and it really conflicts with the story that they wanted to present in tone. Like, the film tries to present something different and dark, but still feels shackled by the squeaky clean image that Disney holds that held it back from being a legitimately great overall tonal story, and that's kind of sad to think about. Like, the comedic tone really contrasts hard with what they were trying to say, and I think it's generally just a problem that comes with public perception. Going back again where even Walt Disney wanted to try to make bolder films, but still held back because they never wanted to scare kids at all, even now where I think it hampers a new way for creative storytelling that Disney is missing now. But nevertheless, this movie still remains to be one of the most profound pieces of art that Disney has ever attempted to do, proving how much they can say beyond the bubbly princesses and talking animals, and it's why I love it today where it presents us the good and bad of man's own heart. And that's why I really wanted to talk about it in detail because of what it wanted to say for a Disney movie from its setting, its characters, and its powerful soundtrack. And speaking of that soundtrack, it is one of the most grand that Disney has to offer with its powerful Latin choir, deep meaningful songs, and just being outright emotional that gets you invested in the story and that is something that everyone can agree on when it comes to watching it. Now the first thing to note when it comes to watching The Hunchback is how it's the journey of our two main characters in the hero and the villain himself. Frollo and Quasimodo, where the question and the message that the movie wants to ask you is to find out who is the monster and who is the man. Something that would be simple on the surface by what you see on the screen, but it's clearly much more complex when you understand the story. And of course, their story is vastly different from the original where he was the archdeacon and actually cared for Quasimodo, where there is more complexity to his character, but the way they wanted to portray him in the film itself actually worked better and was complex to show the nastiness and unlikable side of villainy and heroes that we have haven't seen from Disney before. Like I said many times, he's the best Disney villain that they have ever created and it's something that they would never do ever again and that is sad to see. And this is done by using Kloppin as the film's primary narrator, teaching the background to young children to ease them into the story like they tried to do in real life before diving into the darker tone that we see in later. And from the beginning, they present this grim situation involving the Romani in Paris, including Quasimodo's parents, where right from the get-go, it shows us where we want to focus in our hero and villain. Villain, the baby Quasimodo whose parents are trying to cross safely into Paris, and then contrasting that with the tyrannical Minister of Justice being Claude Frollo, who holds a very large disdain for the gypsies. No real background to why, but it's just there to show how many people just hold a burning hatred for others during the time justified through their own devotion of religion and purging of what they perceive as wicked. An interesting take on how people viewed the world back then. It works well for the film to show that he's someone you don't want to end up like, committing to a path that is wrong but justified as right because of his devotion to the Most High. And this is something we see continued where he's dead set on chasing down this poor woman running to Notre Dame for sanctuary, rushing to the conclusion that what she has is stolen goods and not caring or being responsible for her own death on the steps of Notre Dame in any way. Where it's only now that he realizes it's a baby, when he sees it, he rushes to judgment that it is a deformed monster that must be killed, willing to drown a baby right then and there. This really sets in the tone that Frollo is the most darkest villain that they have ever made willing to put down others for looking a certain way despite being an innocent child that has done no wrong and only stopped by the archdeacon of the church. And I like the archdeacon's character because he contrasts with the attitude of the religion with the religious, how Frollo's actions have upset the Most High, where when he sees the eyes of the statues of Notre Dame staring into his soul, it was like he was being judged by the heavens themselves because God can see all, regardless of where he stands and what he believes in, where it's a powerful moment that showcases his fragility as a character who wants to do anything to 
save his soul while trying to commit to this heinous action that he does, accepting responsibility to raise Quasimodo to atone for his own sins. But even though that's the case, it's not like all is forgiven because we see him express that one day this foul creature would prove use to him, still looking down upon him as a tool rather than human that the church or God himself has tasked him to take care of for punishment of his own actions, that he really doesn't care about the actual details when it comes down to it because he is just in saying that the world is wicked from the surface and not from within his own heart. And this is where we cut back to Kloppin, who then asks the children, and by extent us, the audience, the question of who is the monster and who is the man, used through the puppet silhouette of him raising Quasimodo, ending this segment wonderfully with a powerful chorus of the bells of Notre Dame, and finally introducing us to our main hero, finishing ringing the church bells that we all know of. I mean, words cannot express how much I think this is the best opening to a Disney movie that I have ever seen because of the music, its characters, and its tone that really set the stage of what kind of film it wanted to be, and where it wanted to take Disney in the greatest period of filmmaking ever. And it's done to show us where Quasimodo is at in his life, where when he sees his face for the first time, despite being physically unglamorous, he really comes off as very charming, a kind gentle soul who would gladly want to be friends with anyone who helps this bird have the courage to fly off with the others. In short, this scene really answers the question that Kloppen actually presented us a few minutes ago, showing us that Quasimodo is a regular loving man who has been forced to stay in the bell tower as the bell ringer because of his ugly looks, whereas as a result, he actually talks to the gargoyles that are alive, the worst part of the film overall. I mean, like I said, they aren't a bad concept where people like to say that they are alive in Quasi's mind only due to being cooped up here for years, but then again, they actually are alive considering what happens later in the film and its dreadful sequel. Where I kind of agree with the notion that they aren't bad if they just involve Victor and Laverne being the perfect guides to help Quasi, but that is actually completely muted and dragged down by Hugo and his over comedic attitude that contrasts with the film's overall ideals. I mean, I don't dislike what Jason Alexander has provided here and other Disney content like in the Aladdin series. Series, but just wish Hugo wasn't involved in this film in any way because it hinders the plot regarding the other main characters in the story. But anyways, beyond that, this is where we learn of Quasi's main goal of wanting to attend the festival but cannot go because of Frollo's orders and the reaction the public would have against him, which is what his friends proposed to encourage him to go and do it, where he should be able to do and live his life regardless of what society says because that's the only way he'll live. But then again, it's stopped by Frollo once again when he comes to chat for lunch. It's here where we settle in the idea that monsters like Quasi will never be welcome because of how Frollo perceived the world, reaffirming that he cannot go because of the cruel world that they inhabit, where only he goes because he has to uphold his duties as a public official, not caring for the festivities at all and looking down upon it as the dregs of humankind itself. This then, of course, gets us to the song Out There, where throughout this film, we constantly see things shift through the perspectives of their very songs, beginning through Frollo's point of view here, of the world being full of hatred and wickedness, where of course, in some cases, you have to to admit that he's not wrong. The world is full of wickedness and sin, but he is actually a part of that going back to Kloppen's own lyrics from the Bells of Notre Dame that stated he saw corruption everywhere except within, not willing to accept that he has much sin and wickedness as much as anyone else. And of course, leaving stating that Quasi must stay, which gives him the chance to share his perspective of just wanting to spend a day with everyone. It's a beautifully animated sequence that showcases the thrills that he wants to experience by being out there. He doesn't ask for much other than to experience that, and that is something truly heartbreaking to see from the fact that a man like Frollo just kept him up here where the only thing he wants in life is to spend one day out there and just content living up here for the rest of his life, a fleeting moment only to be shackled by society's standards for eternity, where that is no actual way to live, but easily a heartwarming moment to know how compassionate he is as a character who wants to spend time with the public who finally gets encouraged to do it by the end of the song. Everything about Quasi's character is just very beautiful to me, and I'd love him for that. This then introduces us to our other characters like Phoebus and the beauty and center of the film, the girl we know as Esmeralda. From this view, we see a war hero return home being assigned as the new captain of the guard, who we are shown as a kind nobleman helping out those in need while the other guards share in Frollo's opinion about upholding this definition of the world looking down upon people like Esmeralda. This is also another stark contrast from the novel where Phoebus was another antagonist in the book, being a vain, untrustworthy womanizer who Esmeralda actually fell in love with, were also evidently enough, he was engaged to his cousin and only wanted a one night stand with Esmeralda, and actually survived the course of the book to see Esmeralda's own execution where all the other main characters died except for him who showed no remorse and remained married to his cousin, living a miserable life with her. 
I mean, yeah, everything that Disney adapted was truly way more darker than we realized when where you can see how lame and normal this is as a movie wanting to represent people like Phoebus as a supporting protagonist instead that helps Quasi rather than knocks him down because of Esmeralda fell in love with a jerk rather than a noble man. Sin. But anyways, this leads us back to Frollo where he lays down what he expects of his new captain of the guard while explaining why he must eradicate the gypsies. I mean, this scene isn't fully fleshed out in its background wise, but it does enough to show you how dark a man's heart can be to believe a certain way. Being born into this world of corruption and darkness justifies his own way of thinking, which we can't agree with in any way, but we understand where they're coming from as many other horrific figures of the past have actually demonstrated and proved. Something I've already talked about in my Frollo video a bit earlier, about understanding Frollo's character but not excusing any of his actions. This then leads us to the festival where Quasi gets dragged down by Kloppen, where you can see he already knows who he exactly is because of how much he knows about him and Frollo's own story, encouraging him to get out there. He's an interesting figure throughout the film where we don't know much about his intentions going back and forth, but does so to answer the question that the film presents us and leaves us caught up with Esmeralda for the first time in Quasi's and Frollo's view, looking down on a figure of such beauty. This puts her as the central conflict in both of their stories knowing what she holds for both of them, an angelic figure and a devil of desire. This then reveals Quasi to the public where Kloppen encourages him to become the king of fools, letting him be celebrated by the public and virtually angering Frollo in the process seeing that he is out there when he ordered him not to, where this allows Frollo's guards to change things to have him humiliated instead of being praised a few seconds earlier, where Frollo actually allows this because he has been vindicated and justified for his opinions despite the plea of his son to actually help him, or even Phoebus knows that it's wrong but still is ordered not to until Esmeralda changes everything to free him because she sees an innocent man being abused by the public where everyone now only stops their stupid foolishness. It's an important change that shows somebody that actually accepts him and doesn't care what he looks like and upsets Frollo because it challenges his own viewpoint to be free while Frollo gets enraged to look after her, angry at Quasi for disobeying him leading him to go back inside in disgrace. It's a constant test for his character for believing in the most simple things to be a part of and love, where when watched from the point of view of Frollo really makes him wonder if he is worth anything but a bell ringer. It leads us to see that she's inside Notre Dame herself to seek sanctuary much like Quasi's mother did, where Phoebus actually finds her and it finally introduces himself and in presenting him as a respectful man who sees her as an individual rather than an object of someone's desire as others actually do. But of course that's changed at the same time because Frollo actually finds them where of course he encourages her to claim sanctuary in order order to stop him from taking her out of the church as a holy place of protection, which angers Frollo when the Archdeacon comes to uphold it, where he has to respect the values of the church to try and uphold his relation to God. But this isn't before we get to see his full on creepy attitude, grabbing her from behind and smelling her own hair, really settling the fact that this guy is not to be trusted or good in the slightest in any way because his lustful desire is impacting him in the scene. Out of all the scenes in Disney, this really does feel like the darkest for what it implies, especially if we were to take into account the original story that actually had her at 16 and likely that Frollo is in his 60s and 70s. I mean, he was in his 30s in the actual novel, but then again, that is still a huge age gap no matter how much you tried to say this version of Esmeralda could be early 20s at all because that is creepy. This lets in the fact that either she can stay here, which wouldn't last long because her kind don't do well inside stone walls or get out and virtually become his own personal object, not a welcoming position which leads her to let out her frustration against the public for what they did to Quasi and Frollo's own actions, which of course leads to this moment where the Archdeacon guides her to say that we can't all solve the wrongs of the world unless we ask through God himself. This leads us to the beautiful song about God help the outcast and contrasts her against the others who pray to him for the material stuff, just wanting help for her own people and the ones that are being prosecuted, the song that showcases her selflessness as a character. It's the one that brings up the question like didn't people like Jesus suffer through persecution throughout his life for what he did and what he believed? Believed in, which of course throughout this film we see that Frollo is doing to her own people, where she doesn't ask for much but to show the same care and compassion for them as any other, where the prayers of the others are just vain and just in it for themselves. I mean not fully because it does reflect that people just want something to be happy like Quasi himself alone where Esmeralda actually just wants something for everyone. The act of the selflessness which we could see through people like Jesus suffering for the sins of mankind, to pray for mercy where despite the questions he still has about the suffering of the world, she still looks to God having faith for him through all of this suffering to forgive all the wrongs of the world. And at the end of the song, it seems like her prayers do get seemed to answered when Quasi almost steps into view, but also gets spooked by the fucking imbecile who 
should burn in hell for all of eternity being an asshole to him, where she chases down to him after talking to Quasi. It's a great moment overall because like I said, it's the kind of representation of God answering her prayer by having them both meet together again and realizing the true goodness of the world through their own views and allows her to see his own home. Astounded by his work and his own passion and showcasing the beautiful view from above where she presents her argument against Frollo for him to learn, where he was led to believe that most of her kind is evil, questioning how a cruel man like Frollo can raise a sweet boy like Quasi, where he was lied to at the beginning to being taken in the end because he was abandoned and it's one where we get to see the palm reading that says he has no monster lines whatsoever. It shows him a new perspective constantly that proves he is more of a man than a monster than he was led to believe and encourages him to lead Esmeralda to escape, which he becomes grateful, leaving a pendant for him if he's ever in trouble to find them and has him face to face with Phoebus who he thinks is a threat to her but then grateful for the fact that Quasi is a good friend for her and another person who doesn't look down upon Quasi for his own appearance. This then leads us to Heaven's Light and Hellfire part of the movie where Quasi sings about his positive experiences with her, falling in love with someone who sees him for who he truly is as a person, a girl that is also ostracized from the public being what she is, where the song can also be seen as someone just accepting him for who he is rather than romantical feelings, but of course he actually does demonstrate his love for Esmeralda in the song. The song is meant to be representing one extreme to see her as an angel and a reason why he won't get the girl as we see later because of people like Phoebus actually seeing her as a person. And this song is also left really short because it leads us back to Frollo to contrast with this entire view in the greatest Disney villain song ever created and the best songs overall, where it's just being the darker extreme to heaven's light in Hellfire. Now I've already talked about Hellfire before in my Frollo video but there's just so much to love about this to showcase his feelings in the moment where you can actually feel for Frollo, seeing and feeling things he never felt questioning if he's worth saving considering he does beg for mercy but also still chooses to blame others for his own fault and sin by the tone of the song. The song itself with his Latin choir seems to contradict him like it's his own inner thoughts knowing that everything from him is with from within but he can't help it being the way he is from the very beginning and seeing the world as unjust where even he himself blames God for making the devil stronger than the man not accepting his own choices giving in to the devil's way of thinking of his lust for Esmeralda and his own genocidal actions ones that he has committed for many years at this point. And the whole point of the song of Hellfire is for Frollo to ask the Virgin Mary to protect him and forgive him for giving in to his sinful desires towards the girl to avoid eternal damnation at all costs, which most people see that he's actually given this opportunity when the guard comes from the light that says she's vanished from the cathedral. It's a moment that leads people to think that this is the message that God is actually saying, giving him to get a chance to be saved, to turn away from his wicked ways chasing after her to be redeemed, which is actually something we know won't happen, but shows where even the darkest of Disney villains deserve a chance to reform, which is a really powerful statement to say about the film and what you can derive from it. The light that showcases you can turn back from your ways no matter who you are. But as expected, he actually rejects that choice, fully committed to finding Esmeralda instead, where at least he does just ask for mercy on his soul because he actually knows what he's doing is wrong, stating that she will be his or will burn next to the floating spirits with the upside down crosses of Saint Peter that reflects that he has chosen his fate that will burn him in hell for eternity. And this is where things turn for the worse for his character, tired from the troubles of the night before, where you can derive from his red eyes that he's really out for blood, which we see what happens when he goes on this rampage throughout every house in Paris to root out the Romanis from the Parisians' home to find where Esmeralda is. Something Phoebus doesn't like at all and protests once he places this innocent family under house arrest, declaring and locking their home as traitors despite the pleas that he ignores, ordering to burn the house down because he does not care that he's committed himself to finding this girl no matter the cost even if his own sanity is thrown out the window for it. We see in scenes like this that the movie really wanted to take a darker path to show us who the monster is now, that we have established this clear picture throughout our main two where Quasi being the light and Frollo being the dark, where he tries to punish Phoebus for saving the family from the fire with death, only narrowly escaping because of Esmeralda herself, unconscious but still saved at the last second where we cut to a shot of Paris burning because of Frollo's actions, a powerfully tragic scene that really makes you hate his character and where he questions how she could have escaped leading him to wander back up with Quasimodo being the only one who could have known since the church is in fact his home. But this then leads us to the worst scene in the movie because the humor of Hugo drags the scene down and focuses on the gargoyles to make sure Esmeralda's safe for Quasi's sake and his love for her. Because this is where I really want to actually make my only big complaint about the film itself and their characters with the song A Guy Like You. Now I don't think it's bad necessarily, it's just fine, but tonally with everything 
everything else in the film and the fact that Paris is burning right now in a serious moment does not make this scene any sense at all to begin with to lead Quasi's hope and love for the girl. Like there's literally no way you can justify this ever making any sense other than trying to calm down the kids for the murderous Frollo who just burned down everyone's home just two seconds before the song even started. Like even then if that was the intention, it really shifts things so hard that it really doesn't make any sense tonally for the entire story and I really hate it. I mean, this is also the song that comes after Hellfire so it just makes things 10 times worse. I mean, it also drags the next scene down where she actually appears to keep Phoebus safe which actually breaks Quasi's heart because she's actually fallen in love with this guy. Because these stupid ass gargos kept Quasi's spirits up with the song about his love for her and now it appears like she loves this man and it just ruins things. These guys are fucking assholes. If it never existed, I actually would be fine with the scene to realize it's not about love for Quasi despite being connected with her and realizing the more important element of acceptance for him rather than straight up relationships but no, the gargoyles just had to exist to ease kids fears about the movie and the big bad of Frodo. Like, come on guys, we can do better than this in a totally different movie. But anyways, this leads us back to Frodo to find out the truth which he already suspects about Quasi helping her escape. His attitude really confirming this to him when he finds the little statue he made of her, blaming Quasi for what he did to burn Paris down to find her, trying to instill onto him that her kind is a capable of love or anything he experienced as contrast to their own views. The constant test of the character is to find out what is right. It's a powerful scene because we keep seeing Frollo playing the blame game which affects Quasi to know if he's right. Composing himself, realizing what he did to try and calm himself to remind him of the pain both of them went through and his own mistakes to focus on in the goal of finding where the Romani people are hiding. This then sends Phoebus and Quasi to find her as soon as possible, led on by her compassion that she showed him and finding them before being captured by a misunderstanding by Kloppen and the others in the Court of Miracles, where like I said, he really is a mysterious figure acting like he doesn't know the two and then sending them to be executed like Frollo would do despite actually knowing them. I mean, he could be trolling in order to protect the Court of Miracles from Frollo, but he still almost did it before Esmeralda said stop to free them and thankful for them to come here to try and allow them to escape before he comes. But but of course he does where he already knew that where they were, happy that Quasi helped to find them and putting her up for execution alongside capturing the living Phoebus and putting Quasi in chains from interfering. It leads things down to feel all hopeless in the third act of the film where it feels like he resigns to his fate like Frollo was right all along and nothing he would do would change the fact while Frollo gives Esmeralda the choice to be with him or to burn for eternity. And of course we all know what she chooses because that would be a better fate than to be with him where he decides that burning her will seal all of his problems forever. But then this action causes Quasi to be enraged, remembering what she saw him for, where because of his impressive strength, he manages to break free and climb down the savior, much to Frollo's anger and the cheers of the crowd, who are led angry by Frollo's own actions, burning their houses down and almost destroying their property. Of course, it upsets Frollo knowing the plan was ruined and causing him to chase after them, demanding the guards break down Notre Dame herself, reflecting his sanity completely broken because he no longer respects the church by this very action. And of course we see Phoebus freed because of Quasi's actions and instills an uprising amongst the commoners against the guards to revolt against Frollo's actions and helping Quasi out overall. And the scene gets more intense when we see the molten lead being spread out beyond the church so that no one has access inside to protect her but of course Frollo was behind so he could enter in which represents his future fate sealed in hell because of his own dark actions separated from the public that are actually behind that because they did no wrong where you can actually see this sealed fate closing by this magnificent shot. It's really well done and I really love it. And even more confirmed of his own dark actions that sealed his fate is how he no longer respects anything of the church or God himself by the way he throws down the archdeacons, sealing this attitude for his own character tried to rid of them once and for all, where when he sees Quasi mourn over Esmeralda who appears to be dead, he gets a chance to finally stop him as well. But Quasi stops him knowing what he planned and showcasing his attitude finally changed where he finally understands the reason why the world is dark and cruel is because of people like him, that people like Frollo are responsible for the wickedness and darkness of the world that God has seen and is now standing up to him and also saying that Esmeralda lived at the same time which actually sets them both off for one to save her and the other one to kill her. And what I would like to add for this scene is how I like I mentioned earlier that the score is elevated by this Latin choir in the background due to how all church choirs at the time would actually sing in the language. I mean I don't know a lot about the church choirs and stuff but I like this choice of how it showed where Christianity was formed in and makes everything feel more grand in the final decision 
visions of the character and outcome of the movie represented by the ever conflicting ideals of the two main characters in the moment, which we see when Frollo is dead set on killing them both, which he almost does finding them and finally showcasing his heart by stating the truth about his mother. This shocks Quasi but and allows Frollo to actually catch him off guard by his cloak, which he does fall, but of course he was strong enough to pull Frollo down with him, where the interesting thing I would like to add about this is how Quasi still hangs on to him where he could have let him go and end this knowing everything he's done in his life, showcasing the more goodness of his heart despite everything he's done, knowing that like I said earlier in the Hellfire scene, that there are so many ways that show that helps Frollo that he can be redeemed, reflecting of how like people say that God is always after your heart up until your death like he deserves you a chance to be saved despite any actions you do in your life, no matter how bad things can see, you still have that chance. But people like Frollo in this situation refuse to accept that reality, where we see Frollo choosing to swing back onto the Gargo in for the final kill, being sadistic and creating a fictional bible verse to end them forever, but of course stopped by the cracks that barely support him, lighting up like an actual spirit or what people actually find to be God himself in the scene or anyone up high, sending him down with fear to his final fate in hell as represented by the molten lead below, ending his reign of terror and his misguided opinions about the world. It is truly the most powerful moment and the most powerful villain arc that I have ever seen in a Disney movie and it really worked so well and I'm grateful for that. And of course, we see Quasi slip in the moment much to her terror before actually being saved by Phoebus, much to their delight instead, thankful and hugging him to where they are now both finally free. In a way, it's an answer prayer from what Esmeralda gave to God earlier in the film, which is kind of nice to interpret having their character arcs fulfilled, where he accepts both of them being in love, very content with that because it never really was important to him, knowing what really matters and that's what makes this okay, because of how both of them already saw each other as regular humans for Quasi to actually learn and finally changing things in the public where they celebrate this victory, finally bringing him out where the girl from the beginning of the film comes to greet and embrace him to finally see how people have actually accepted him. This is the perfect conclusion to his own character arc where people finally truly get to see who the man from the monster is who just died minutes ago and how people just cheer Quasimodo's name and accept him for who he is as much as anyone else, bringing back the bells of Notre Dame to celebrate this very occasion ending the film perfectly. Looking back on The Hunchback, it did have the right tools for success but still failed in some areas to really deliver a legitimate great experience overall in tone but I still enjoyed it for what it was being their darkest masterpiece that they ever made and I really mean that. What they did with this was very admirable to present something unique within Disney that they have never really done, the hardest they would go and never go back to which is very sad to see. Everything it did was a great blueprint to try and present something more profound and mature as a kid's story and as an animated story that can be enjoyed by all. The legacy it really leaves is how you appreciate it growing up with the messages and questions of knowing the good and bad in people and that will always live on for a very long time. And one day, if Disney decides to get their act together, I hope we try to get to explore very similar things and darker tones in their films to present us with rich deep stories that need to be explored. And with that said, I'm all done, so goodbye.